It's uh, great to be back here at Stanford. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is um, my first slide, which really has nothing to do with my talk whatsoever. But um, you know, we've seen this slide a lot at uh, previous versions of this conference, and I've barely seen it at all at this conference. So I said, what the heck? Someone's got to show it. There it is. <laughs> all right, here's another slide we see all the time. And this does have to do with my talk. This is about, obviously, hits from uh, GWAS. And that's what I want to talk about today. Algorithms for GWAS and for other kinds of association studies as well. FIWAS, EWAS, EQTL. So uh, for the last, oh, six years or so, uh, several of us at Microsoft Research have been working on algorithms for association studies. Uh, there's a lot of them that we've put together. They're available open source at GitHub. And today, uh, I have time to tell you just about two of them. Uh, both of them have to do with increasing power, that is, finding more signal from your data. Uh, one very obvious way to increase power is to increase your sample size. And when you do that, of course, there are computational issues, uh, big data issues, and so forth. And so I'll, uh, one of the examples we'll talk about is taking an algorithm that uh, before uh, was completely uh, intractable to apply to uh, data sets of the size that we see in association studies and show you how we made it possible to apply to uh, these very large data sets. And another example of increasing power is a situation where you have the data that you have and you'd love to get more power out of it. And so this is a, a general trick that will help you. Uh, we'll talk about a general trick that will help you get more data out of the data, uh, more power out of the data that you have. OK, so I don't think I have to convince anyone here that it's a good thing to increase sample size. There are many interesting phenotypes out there that are highly polygenic. So you have lots and lots of SNPs influencing a particular phenotype. And each one of those influences is very tiny. So to get a comprehensive picture of the um, genetic influence of all these SNPs on that phenotype, you need large samples. And, and we've heard the last few days of groups putting together data sets with sample size on the order of 100,000, going up to a million. And that's the sort of scale that I want to talk about today. Now, when you have these large data sets, uh, you tend to get more and more confounding. Examples include confounding due to family relatedness. And another uh, good example is confounding due to population structure. Uh, so let me just briefly describe population structure. I imagine many of you know this already. But if you do, please bear with me. Uh, this is a very simple example. We're looking at one SNP here. We're asking the question, is this SNP correlated with having the, the disease or not? Uh, so each circle here corresponds to an observation for a given individual. And in this data, as you can see, there's two populations, maybe two different ethnicities. In one population, in population one, you have more A's than T's. And in population two, you have more T's than A's. And let's suppose, for whatever reason, uh, the people f uh, with disease uh, come more from population one, and the people without the disease come more from population two. Now you ask the question, is there a correlation between the SNP and having the disease? And you can see it with your eyes. Uh, the people with disease, uh, there's more A's than T's. People without the disease, there's more T's than A's. Yes, there's a correlation. But we don't care about these correlations. The, what we're looking for are causal correlations. And uh, this is just a correlation that's spurious. It's due to the population structure here. There's nothing about causality going on here uh, about the, the SNP causing the disease. So we don't like these kinds of associations. We call them false positives, type 1 error, and uh, spurious associations. We want our algorithms to not find these. OK, so the animal breeders of dozens of, of, of like four decades ago uh, figured this out. And they came up with a very nice solution called a linear mixed model. Uh, linear mixed models. Uh, very nicely correct for this, these sorts of confounding and other forms of confounding. <clears throat> and uh, here's an example of that. This is a very messy data set. It's a data set with eight different ethnicities in it and with closely related individuals. If you apply linear regression, you get lots and lots of false positives. If you apply the linear mix model, you control very well for the type 1 error. Uh, th for those of you that don't know, don't know, this is a QQ plot. If you don't know what a QQ plot is, don't worry about it. The main point is that linear mix models correct for confounding very well. So there's several ways to think about uh, mixed models. 
Uh, and uh, in the time we have, this is probably the better way to think about it because you can explain it very quickly. Uh, the idea here, uh, the idea behind mixed models is don't try to model the confounder explicitly. Instead, compute a measure of similarity between each pair of individuals, maybe based on their SNPs, and then use that measure of sim similarity to correct for confounding. And the basic idea is the more similar two individuals are, the more likely they should have similar phenotypes. So the linear mixed model captures that idea and in so doing corrects for confounding. Uh, you might ask what kind of similarity measure should I use? Well, it turns out from first principles, the dot product, the good old dot product that you learned early in algebra, uh, that turns out to be a very good measure of similarity. So here's, uh, some sort of, uh, here's some confounding structures that you might see in data. Uh, these are heat maps. Uh, the redder the color, the more similar two individuals are. And we're using the x and y axis to just index individuals. So if you have a data set with three ethnicities, you'd see this uh, uh, sort of checkerboard pattern here, three blocks across, three blocks down. If you have a, a data set with family relatedness in it, you'd see the uh, heat map in the middle, very fine-grained structure. And if you're lucky enough to have a data set with no confounding structure in it, you just have a diagonal saying that one individual is very similar to him or her, herself and to no one else. So linear mixed models work great at correcting for confounding, but there's a catch. They're very computationally expensive. So you have this similarity matrix that you have to deal with, an n by n matrix for n individuals. And then you go to compute p-values, and you have to manipulate this uh, matrix. And uh, the computations end up scaling cubically in the number of individuals. So that means, for example, if you were to double the size of your data set, double the number of individuals you have in that data set, the runtime for your algorithm would go up by a factor of eight. And uh, for any sorts of realistic uh, association study size data sets, for example, if you have a million SNPs, uh, this algorithm is completely infeasible, even for a small number of individuals. So what we did several years ago is to identify a set of algebraic manipulations that greatly speed up this linear mixed model. Uh, we call it uh, uh, FASTLIM. FAST stands for Factored Spectrally Transformed. Well, who are we kidding? It's, it stands for FAST, and then we worked our way backwards. But, <laughs> but yeah, the algorithm is, is FAST. Uh, instead of uh, scaling cubically in the number of individuals, it scales linearly in the number of individuals. Dramatic speed up. There's another factor k here, which I'll describe in a moment. So there's no way I'm going to go into the math, but let me just give you a flavor for these algebraic tricks. Uh, the first, there's two tricks, basically. The first trick is to take this similarity matrix and factor it. We do what's called a spectral decomposition. Then you take one of these factors and use it to rotate your data. Rotate the SNPs, rotate the phenotype, and when you do that, you transform the linear mixed model into linear regression. And in doing that, you pick up one factor of n speed up. So now instead of being cubic in n, we're now quadratic in n, where again, n is the number of individuals. Uh, the second trick holds when the similarity measure you use is the dot product, which is what we're using anyway. And now the idea here is you have many, many SNPs that you want to test. Maybe you have a million SNPs that you want to get p-values for. You don't have to use all those SNPs to compute the similarity between individuals. You can use a subset of them. And when the number that you use, let's call it k, when k is less than the number of individuals, the runtime for uh, the linear mixed model becomes linear in n. So there's three factors here, m, the number of SNPs that you want to get p-values for, n, the number of individuals in your data set, and k, the number of individuals you're using to compute the similarity between two individuals. And under these conditions, uh, the algorithm is linear in all three of them and quite feasible for uh, realistic size uh, association studies. So how do you find k less than n? Well, you exploit linkage disequilibrium. If you have two SNPs that are near each other and they're highly correlated, you don't have to use both of them uh, in your computation of the similarity. Just use one of them. And so basically what you do is you go through your SNPs, you thin them out using linkage disequilibrium, much as you would design a SNP chip array. Uh, the number of SNPs you're going to need will depend on the data set, how much linkage to equilibrium there is, uh, but we have algorithms for figuring out what the right number is. OK, so that's the story about scaling an algorithm. Now let's go to the other case where we have the data that we have, but we, we'd love to get more 
uh, power out of it. And the, the basic fundamental idea here is an extension of a very famous quote by George Box, who said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And there's, there's a kind of a continuous notion here. And, and the idea behind getting more power is to try to bring your model and data closer together. So your model has a certain set of assumptions. Your data has a certain set of properties. If you can bring those things closer together, you're going to get more power out of your association studies. Now, one way to do that is to bring the model to the data. Study the data, think about it, build a model that represents the data well, and sure enough, you'll get more power. The other way is to bring the data to the model. So um, leave the model alone, and then transform the data somehow to make it closer, to make its properties closer to the assumptions of the model. And here's one example of doing that. Uh, this is uh, for case control uh, genome-wide association studies. So we, here we have a binary phenotype. Does the patient have the disease or not, for example? And uh, linear mixed models aren't designed to work with zero-one 1 phenotypes. They're designed to work with continuous phenotypes. So what we can do is take our original data with the zero-one 1 data and transform it to data with continuous phenotypes and then apply the linear mixed model to that transformed data. The way we do this transformation in this case is we use what's called a liability threshold model, uh, which is very simple. It says it's, there's a little graphical model there showing how it works. You have a set of SNPs that influence a hidden variable called the liability, and then that hidden variable is thresholded to produce the 0, 1 data. So again, what we do is we take our data with 0, 1 phenotypes, we push it through this liability threshold model, and in so doing, we estimate values for this hidden variable, and then we can take that, those values for the hidden variables and use them uh, with the linear mix model to do the association analysis. Uh, sure enough, uh, that works really well. The algorithm's called LEAP, Liability Estimators of Phenotype. And as you can see here, this is on synthetic data. Uh, anything over one means the algorithm's doing better. Uh, the transformed data works better than the uh, non-transformed data. And you can see as the sample size grows, uh, the amount of additional power you get also grows. OK, that's all the time I, ha I have. Uh, in summary, you know, you can... Uh, you can scale algorithms uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, handle uh, much larger data sets. Uh, linear mixed models in particular, you can scale them. Uh, and uh, in this case, algebra comes to the rescue. Uh, and um, in cases where you're not worried about ne necessarily the size of the data, but you just want to get more power out of the data that you have, uh, you can try to bring the model and data closer together. So with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators and thank you for listening.